Commodore VIC-20. Man, I forgot, this is a PHP developers. Old, right? There's a bunch of gray hair in here. VIC-20, is there, is there a 14-year-old here? Right there. Okay, we, this thing here, see that right there? That was a cassette drive. Do you know what a cassette is? You don't know what a cassette is, do you? You do, okay. We had to load it in there. And uh, I'm five years old, 1985, when I got this computer. Who else had this computer, by the way? Put up your hands. Oh, yeah. Did you have the floppy disk adapter? Oh, God, you had some money or something? <laughs> I begged my parents for that shit. Um, oh, by the way, see what it's hooked up to? Old, old television set, right? Man. And as soon as I got this thing, I was like hooked on it. Because you could fool around with it. And I discovered there's a manual, like how to learn basic. How many, for how many of you was basic your first language you ever? You guys are fucking old. Look at this. <laughs> there's some gray hair in this room. Um, but you know that first moment, at least for me, is when I could get the computer to print something on the screen. It's just kind of magical, right? And I remember like doing this stuff, fiddling around with it, and just kind of falling in love with computers. Specifically, I loved making things with computers. I loved being able to like create a little program for my brothers or my parents, like show off a little bit, you know, show off to your friends, being able to have them push a button and change colors or whatever we did back then. Uh, sometimes when it got a, a little bit further, um, any of you guys have a Tandy 1000? You guys remember the whole, oh, man, this is awesome. We're having a little nostalgia uh, talk here. Um, but I used to edit the auto exec bat and pretend, make it seem like there was a virus on my computer. So when my dad loaded up, any of you guys do that? Your computer has a virus. And it was just like pause and had to click. Um, and I you know, kept getting more and more into it. And really, I became a geek at a pretty young age. You know, five, and in fact, let's do a little audience participation. You guys all have your computers out. I know some of you are like doing work and stuff, checking Twitter. I want you to Google nerd mullet, and then I want you guys to guess which one is me in the ninth grade. Basically, same as this guy right here. So you guys Google that, nerd mullet. Who am I in those pictures? Google image search, you know? There's some pretty good ones there. I actually won Motley Crue tickets with this photo. I submitted in a contest. This is me in the ninth grade right here. Now, this story, this photo doesn't tell the whole story. I got glasses, braces, and headgear in the same week. I was homeschooled this year, too. I, I, had, the full, I had the full deal. And you know, I'm still messing around with computers. Uh, it was kind of a cool time to be alive, actually, because, you know, we got a 386. It had a modem. You could, like, actually connect to people. Uh, anyone on FidoNet? Was anyone on FidoNet? BBSs? Uh, Legend of the Red Dragon? Anyone play that? Holy, this is awesome. Um, so got more and more into it. And uh, at one, <laughs> one day, my parents invited this neckbeard from the local university to come and help me get hooked up to Usenet on the university computers, like 13 or 14 or something like that. And he gave me a printout like this, like 600 pages like of Unix commands and stuff. And I loved it. And a lot of these people I started to hang out with on Usenet groups were into programming. And so one year I asked for a copy of Turbo Pascal for my birthday. And I remember getting it, it came in a box with like 20 disks, and I remember like loading it up and opening the IDE for the first time. And in my, first time in my life, I was kind of sad because for whatever reason, I couldn't grok programming. I tried, I tried you know, doing tutorials. I had every chance to learn, and I just couldn't get it. And 
it didn't stop me from making things with computers. Um, I started like doing uh, menus in ANSI art for bulletin boards. Uh, a friend had HyperCard. I really liked the visual model. It just connected with me. Uh, Macromedia had a product called Authorware I got really into. And then Microsoft Access. Now, I know a lot of you guys think it's a joke, but <laughs> for me, the way I think visually, Microsoft Access was a dream because you could design your whole application visually, fields and buttons, and then you just had to combine it with a little bit of logic in the back end. And for me, this was a dream. And this actually became my first software product. I made a database for charities to keep track of their donors, and I burned it onto some CD-ROMs. I rented a table at a trade show like this, you know, just a kid, me with my CD-ROMs, and I sold two for 20 bucks each. Yeah, pretty good. <laughs> and it was actually kind of a light bulb for me because I was like, whoa, like I really like making things with computers. And there were two people that were like, I'm going to trust this zitty kid with 20 bucks and get his Microsoft Access database and I'm going to buy it from him, right? So I, it started the wheels kind of turning in my head. And it, it's funny, you know, maybe if Laravel had existed when I was a kid, I would have like got programming like, and I would have just done that. But because of my path, my, I kind of got sent along this path here. And I ended up building my whole career on these things. Find out where people are struggling, design software that helps them overcome that struggle, pair with a developer to build it, and then get the word out, do some marketing. And this ended up, uh, eventually I just became a product manager, right? And did that with a bunch of startups in Edmonton and Portland and San Francisco. But I kept doing stuff on the side, kept building stuff on the side. And uh, one thing I did was just writing. It still actually blows my mind. This is one of my most popular essays. Um, it's on justinjackson.ca, or you can just search. I'm a fucking webmaster. Um, I got on CBC Radio for this, and uh, they, could, they had to bleep out every time I said that. It was pretty fun. Um, but I did a lot of writing. Um, what was I going to say? Oh, this still blows my mind, by the way. I was 13 when Mosaic came out, and the idea that a kid in Stony Plain, Alberta, could write something with HTML, which I could totally understand, publish it, and then people around the world could read it, like, that's amazing. It's still amazing to me that that's possible. And then I started a podcast on the side, too, called Product People. And I started to build an audience mostly of software developers. I worked all day with software developers during the day, and then most of the people that read my stuff and listened to the podcast, software developers. And as I kind of went along, I started getting this question a lot. I just built an app. How do I get people to use it? How do I get customers? Have any of you guys ever asked that before? All right. All right, it's okay, put your hands up. You don't have to be, you're in good company. Um, and so I, an, I answered this question so many times that I'm like, I'm just going to write a book about it. So I wrote a book called Marketing for Developers. I think I released it in 2015. And uh, it did really well. I think I've sold like 5,000 copies or something like that. Um, and one thing I realized is that when a developer learns marketing, they're basically unstoppable. It's like giving a developer steroids. See, me, just a jackass, you get product and marketing, and you get a little bit of fire. But then I saw people like, oh, sorry, and this is what ended up happening, actually, is this is the little fire I was able to create, is on the side, I started earning income from all this stuff I was making, right? And so 2012, I made 10,000 on the side, and then doubled it to, to 20, and then to 40,000. Then 2015, I released that book, and I made 66,000. I thought, you know what, maybe I can actually quit my job and move to a ski town and just do this. <laughs> and so that's what we did. 
Uh, and then the first year I went independent was 2016, did about 150,000, and you know, it's kept getting better. This is my little fire, product and marketing together, little fire. But then, <laughs> assholes like this <laughs> came along, and, and Taylor too, you know. And they combined code and product and marketing, and they had a fucking forest fire, you know? Like, they can like create a lot of fire. And so, that's kind of my message today, is it is way easier for you as a software developer to learn some product and marketing skills than it is for a jackass like me to learn some programming skills. And that's a big deal. I'm happy, you know, I'm, I'm, I got my little fire, but you guys could make a lot of fire. So, if a jackass like me can do it, you can do it too. <laughs> All right. So, what I thought I would talk about, if I've got any time left, is I want to help you find a cool idea for a Laravel project so that you can make some money. Is that okay? Are you guys into that? <laughs> Are you guys into that? You, you want to do that? Okay. <laughs> All right. Let's see if we can help you guys out. Here we go. Um, I'm going to talk about one mistake I see all the time and then four action steps. And if I have time after, um, we can, you can ask questions. Um, and I'm okay if you guys have a real, like, uh, what's the, like, a real dick question. If you want to ask me something and be like, hey, what about this? Ask me whatever kind of jerky question you want. It's fine. <laughs> so take out your notepads. <laughs> mark those down. Okay, mistake number one. And this is the one I think I'll get some pushback from. People need my app, they just don't know it yet. Right? And I get this question all the time. One person said, you know, I've just built this software, and there's no need in the market. They said that. There, there's no market demand for it, but I know people need it. I think you got to realize how people actually take action. And I have a friend, James Clear, he's a super smart guy, and he says, this is how people take action. First, they notice something, then they have the desire, they want it, then they do it, they take like action, and then they end up liking it. So let me take this through. You guys heard about Laravel, right? And then you're like, holy shit, this is powerful. Like, I got to get into this. So you wanted to learn more. Uh, how many of you, your gateway drug was Laracast? <laughs> wow. Where is that guy? That guy's like a ghost. You never see that guy. <laughs> Um, but you guys wanted to do something about it, and your first action, the first thing you did, was you subscribed to Laracast, right? And then maybe you built a project, and then after you used it, you're like, I like this, right? It made you feel more awesome as a PHP developer. Is that pretty, you think that's right? Yeah. So this is how people take action. The key piece is number two. People don't take action if they don't want to. People need to lose weight, but they don't want to. There, you know, there's, a, there's an obesity epidemic in the United States. Um, I shouldn't have drank six beers last night, but I wanted to, right? <laughs> so there's a difference between needs and wants. And people buy apps for one reason only. They want their life to be better, and usually right now. If you write down only one thing, write down this. People buy apps for one reason only, and that's because they want their life to be better. And so we hired products to do jobs in our lives, right? So take away my hangover, headache, so I can focus on some Laracon talks today, right? I hired Tylenol to do that. Focusing on a need isn't enough. Your product has to give some people something they want. Here's another illustration. How many of you guys are fans of Elon Musk? Oh my God. My wife has the biggest crush on Elon. If Elon said he will, like, wanted her, she would leave me in a second. <laughs> um, but this is, you know, people need to drive electric cars. We need to, right? We're polluting. Every time we get in these cars, we're polluting, we're ruining the environment. But people don't want to drive this car. <laughs> they want to drive this car, right? So what did Elon do? Elon's actually a perfect example of an engineer who combines product and marketing with his technical know-how. 
He didn't build a shitty little electric car like this that everyone else had done. He built a badass sports car, right? Something people wanted. He wrapped something he thinks the world needs, which is efficient transportation, in something that people wanted. Super important. Okay. How do you guys build something with Laravel that people want? Here's the, the steps. Now, I should give a disclaimer here. These are just the steps that have worked for me. And the other people I've watched do this, maybe they're wrong. I don't know. But these are steps that have worked for me, and it's a good starting point if you're looking to do this. So step number one, focus on a specific group of people. Uh, I've heard this a few times. I've been talking to you guys. How many of you guys have a list with hundreds of ideas, but you don't know where to start? Put up your hands. OK. You've got hundreds of ideas, and it's overwhelming, right? Like, how do I start? What am I going to build? Or uh, I was talking to some guys today. They're like, I start one thing, and I get halfway through it, and then I lose interest, and then I start another thing, right? Instead of starting with an idea, I'm going to recommend that you start with a group of people. And actually, I'll just back up. The reason I recommend this is, first of all, I think it's motivating to uh, know who you're serving. Instead of making everything serve the idea that you came up with at 1 in the morning, you're just thinking about real human beings behind a screen and how you can make their lives better. It's a lot easier, at least for me, to be motivated about a project when I'm like, OK, I'm helping software developers build and launch apps that actually get users. You know, that motivates me to want to finish the book or finish the video tutorial or whatever I'm doing that day. So start with a specific group of people. And here's, there's a few tricks for doing this. One is go, what group do I belong to already? Right. And so for Taylor, he was a PHP developer. And he's like, he kept running into struggles, right, with PHP. And so he said, I'm going to serve other PHP developers, a specific group of people. He could have chosen developers in general. He could have chosen even a bigger group, like, um, oh, I'm going to get in trouble for this, JavaScript developers. What do you guys say, Java? Java or Java? I say Java. I don't, you guys are all wrong. Um, but, you know, he, he chose PHP developers, right? A group that he already knew, a group that he was a part of. Another hack, how many of you are freelancers, consultants, uh, work in an agency, okay, or have a boss? <laughs> okay. If you are in any of those groups, if you are a freelancer, a consultant, or you have a boss, one good trick is to say, what group is already paying me for my time and expertise? And let me give you an example. If you are a consultant right now, you have the best viewpoint for uh, product ideas because you already have people coming to you paying you for stuff. What kind of customers are paying you right now? Here's an example. This is my friend uh, Francois' consulting company. And all they ended up doing, it just happened, was basically building uh, websites and apps and plugins for Shopify stores. That was his business. That was his client, his clientele. And this same feature request kept coming up over and over and over again. And it was basically this. Now, this idea sounds completely stupid to me, but there was demand from his clients. This is the thing. We can't always see from the outside what's going to be a good idea, right? And so his clients were saying, we've got these Instagram uh, profiles and galleries, but we want to make all those photos shoppable. We're taking these beautiful photos, but we want to make them shoppable. So all this app does is it sucks your Instagram photos into a gallery in Shopify and makes them shoppable. Now, to some of us that are technical, we're like, man, that's, it's almost grating. It's like you still have it over here in Instagram, and then you've got it over here too. Like, what's the point? But he kept getting this feature request over and over and over again. And after he built the plugin once or twice, he's like, I'm just going to turn this into a software as a service. And he called it Like to Have It, which I, again, don't think is a great name. But he is making an 
a really good living off this application. It was profitable his first year. He quit consulting full time. And if you're consulting or freelancing or even an employee, you can look at the problems your customers are having and are there any patterns? What do we see over and over and over again? Okay, step number two is to observe their struggle. This is a mindset. You gotta kind of switch. Instead of just being a passive kind of worker that, um, I think one of the worst things we ever did in the product development process is we uh, got in this pattern of just giving uh, developers specs. Here's the specs, go build it. Here's the specs, go build it. Here's the specs, go build it. And uh, I think that's a shame, first of all, because I think uh, developers are some of the most creative problem solvers in the world. Uh, but when you always are hiding the why behind what you're doing, I think that's just damaging for the product overall. But you, as you're building these things, you can start to observe, okay, why and what? Like, what keeps, up com what keeps coming up over and over again? Um, okay, here's a good example. Look at just like, if you're just like browsing the web, what kind of questions come up all the time? And so I just, this morning, I just grabbed a few. Like, should I learn Laravel as a framework after being a, I don't even, what's a PHP procedural program? I don't know what that is. But, you know, people are asking, is, is Laravel too complicated for beginners? Learning PHP and Laravel, uh, I'm a competent computer user. There, you can see there's some struggle, right? I love this one. Ask HN, I'm starting a new job as a PHP developer tomorrow. <laughs> And we're laughing, but we can feel this guy's pain, right? He's like, shit. <laughs> and he says, this part here, is there anything you could recommend? I haven't worked with PHP in years, and I'm worried about my performance. And this is the guy that goes out and buys Laracast that night and like watches all the videos, right? And so, yeah, Jeffrey comes along with a solution to all of this struggle. The struggle that was like, clearly just out there for all of us to see, right? And maybe some of you missed it. Like you were a PHP developer and you're like, man, I really want to learn Laravel and there was just like nothing and nothing and nothing and all of a sudden Jeff comes up with a solution and you're like, that is perfect, right? All right. Step three is create a hypothesis. So my buddy Francois, maybe his hypothesis was Turn my Instagram photos into a shopping gallery so I can sell more products. You've got the struggle and you've got the dream of a better life. I'm struggling to turn these photos into a gallery and my dream of a better life is I want to make more money because that's what Shopify store owners care about. By the way, as a, a quick cheat, most business owners, the people that are going to be paying you for your product, want to save time, save money, or make money. So if your app, your Laravel app, does any of those things, you've got a good chance of selling it. Um, here's another good example of this kind of like struggle and then dream of a better life. Um, never write another loop again. That's the struggle, right? You've got complex, ugly functions. What's the dream of a better life? Learn how to craft simple, elegant code that's a pleasure to write and a joy to maintain. Struggle, dream of a better life, right? And that was his hypothesis going in. I think people are struggling with this. I think I can help them with it. And the magic words you're kind of looking for in this hypothesis is like, give me, help me, free me, make the, take the, uh, equip me, right? Those are the things that often come up when you're helping people get from one point to another. And then step four is to build something small and iterate. Um, is Ian Landsman still here? Just so you guys know, Ian disagrees with everything I say. <laughs> but um, I think this is one thing him and I actually agree on. He's starting a new project. And they're starting small. He always likes to bootstrap uh, new ideas. And uh, starting small and iterating is a great way to build profitable products. Here's an example from my own life. So I'm doing this podcast. I got this blog. And I keep seeing this question, not just on Quora, but in my inbox. How can I keep myself motivated as a sole founder? 
And so I start asking people about it. Not only on Twitter, by the way, but in real life. Uh, if you've encountered me here, you know I ask a lot of questions. Because I want to hear from people in real life. I want to know what they're thinking. I want to kind of dig down into kind of what motivates them. And so as solo founders, do you have some sort of support group that keeps you motivated? Patrick McKenzie responds and says, yeah, I've got this campfire group. It's been really great. And then Nate Cotney responds. Uh, he's the CEO of High Rise now. And he says, I would like to join one of these groups. And then there's a bunch of other people that said, yeah, I'm, I'm looking for that too. So uh, one day I had a really bad day at the job. I was like angry. We hadn't shipped anything in a long time. And uh, I was like, you know what? I'm going to go home and I'm going to launch something tonight and make a dollar tonight. Just to spite all of those people, right? And so I went home with this hypothesis. Give me a support group so that I can stay motivated in my business. And I launched this. Just fucking do it. A campfire chat for solo founders, bootstrappers, and anyone launching their own thing. And uh, it was $10 a month. And I started with like 12 spots, and then those sold out, and then six spots. And then I kept one spot. I kept opening new spots, 10 spots. And so basically all it was is I took your money, and then I sent you a link to the campfire chat. That was it at the beginning. <laughs> But it, uh, oh, did I just lose my, it sold out in, oh, what's going on here? We'll skip that, Java update, classic. <laughs> it sold out in one day. In fact, uh, the worst thing is I was like, I was just like manually shifting gears, like it was like, okay, I'll open it up, and I would just like change the hyperlink on the landing page from like sold out to the actual checkout. And then I accidentally went to sleep and left it in. And I was only supposed to have 20 members. And I ended up having 36 people register overnight, right? But it sold out. And it, it kind of showed me like, whoa, there's some interest here, right? Even with this little dinky thing. And uh, it's continued to evolve since then. Uh, my, my wife made me change the name. Uh, now it's called Product People Club. It was a little bit too hard during like career day with the kids, you know? <laughs> um, so this is what it looks like today. There's actually a few people here in Product People Club. It's a forum and a bunch of other things. And this was a side project that I started when I was a product manager. Um, but it really quickly earned over $70,000. That's Canadian, so it's like five bucks American. <laughs> Good one. <laughs> All right, so your turn. This is kind of your homework. I want you to go home, and I want you to observe your clients, your peers, and your boss. These are all people that pay money to solve problems. We know your clients pay money, or they'd be bad clients. Your peers pay money, because look at all you guys here. You guys all paid good money to be here. Or maybe you didn't pay. Maybe your boss paid, right? So these are the kinds of people you want as customers if you're thinking about building uh, you know, some sort of Laravel web app. You can also do some research online. You know, just as you saw me kind of go through Quora questions and Hacker News uh, threads, you can do all that stuff online. Sometimes I like um, just going to Twitter search and just going like uh, keyword and then question mark. So like Laravel, question mark. And just see what people are asking questions about. What are they struggling with, you know? Uh, and comment threads are specifically are great. Like a lot of people don't love, like a lot of people don't like Hacker News threads. I fucking love Hacker News threads. I just get right, right in there and all these people are complaining. Love it, because there's a lot of struggle there, right? There's product ideas there. <laughs> Uh, and you can also do this kind of research offline, right? Your current clients, your competitors, you know, where are competitors making money? Meetups, conferences, trade shows, all that stuff. And what you want to figure out is this. And this is all, uh, uh, Michelle mentioned jobs to be done earlier. Jobs to be done is an incredible theory for understanding why people buy products. And so if you guys, uh, are looking for some resources on that, I recommend a book called When Coffee and Kale Compete 
and again, a terrible book title. It's free right now, though. And then uh, Clayton Christensen, who's the Harvard researcher who's kind of pushing a lot of this, has a new book called Competing Against Luck. Get the audiobook version and just listen to the first two thirds. Skip the last third. Um, but jobs to be done is basically this. People are over here, but they have a dream of a better life over there. And there's obstacles standing in their way. And so they hire a product, your product, to help them overcome that obstacle and get to a dream of a better life. That is the job of every single product. I'm over here, I've got a dream of a better life, and there's all of this struggle and pain and obstacles in the way. Right? And again, I think if you look at Laravel, it's a really great example of that. Right? You're struggling over here. There's no good PHP frameworks. All of a sudden, there's this one over here, and it helps you overcome the struggle and become more awesome. Here's the questions if, uh, that I just, in written form. Um, the last one, what have they already tried, is also interesting. So I've asked a bunch of you that question. What did you try before Laravel? And what, you know, I tried this, didn't work. Why didn't it work? Uh, it was like too hard to configure. Tried this, didn't work. Why didn't it work? Ah, it was too light, right? And so then you can figure out what do people want? Your competitive advantage is always going to be in how well you understand the customer. It's not going to be your, like, well, sometimes competitive advantage is in tech, um, but it should always start with an understanding of the customer. So Algolia, I'm just guessing now, but Algolia understands that the customer wants things to be fast, and so then they've built uh, you know, on the technical side, a competitive advantage, but it comes from this core of understanding the customer. And again, at home, after you've done all that kind of research, think about what's the smallest product you could create. And I think you've seen, you know, Adam uh, started doing like, you know, I, I don't know if he did workshops before, but workshops is a great place to start. Adam started with a book, open source projects, plugins and add-ons video tutorials. Um, here's a kind of a bonus like opportunity thing. The one place I'm seeing a lot of people have success, probably in the last five years, the only profitable SaaS I've seen uh, launched are all what are called micro SaaS, but really it's just like building a SaaS on top of a bigger platform. So like my friend Francois has a Shopify app, right? And he uses the power of the Shopify app store to, as a channel to reach customers. It's done really well. Slack has an app directory. Heroku has an app directory, right? So you can build on top of those, and then you've got the distribution figured out. The disadvantage is that they can release your thing as a feature and wipe you out. So you're probably not going to have as long of a lifespan. But a lot of these companies you know, go for five, 10 years, and it's a nice little business. The only other kind of tip I'm going to give you is before you start coding, before you do anything, create a landing page with an email sign-up form. Uh, this is what Adam did for Test Driven Laravel. You need to figure out if there's demand, and a good proxy for demand, like people paying you, is them giving you their email address, right? And Adam even got email addresses from fucking developers, so you, know, you, can, you can make it work for you too. Uh, it's gold. And I think 1,000 subscribers is a good benchmark. Once you hit 1,000, you're like, oh, there's something here. People really want this. Launch. Get your first dollar, listen to feedback, and then iterate. And as you're listening to feedback, I want you to remember this. There's only two people you should listen to, someone who has just paid for your app or someone who's just canceled. There's a lot of people that will give you feedback and their opinion doesn't mean shit. Just don't listen to them unless they just paid you or they just canceled. I don't listen to anybody that has not uh, either been a customer, right? And neither does Jason. Um, so I'm, I'm hoping that we've switched from what cool app could I build, which is just kind of really general, and how could I make a specific group of people more awesome? And I think I'll end with this. I don't know what time it is. Three. Oh, am I way over? No, I'm okay. 
Um, this is a picture of my family. How many of you guys have kids? Yeah, I knew, I, I saw it, the old, old people. Um, <laughs> making things with computers is what provides a living for these people. And it's been one of the kind of most amazing things in my life is to be able to do this independently, to have carved out this little business and to provide a life for them. And that's actually my dream for all of you, too. Whether you do it full time or not, there's something about having a little thing on the side that you built, that you launched, that makes a difference to a group of people, makes their lives better, and helps you earn a little bit of independent income on the side. There's something about that feeling, about carving out a little bit of independence for yourself that I've found very empowering. And so that's my hope for you guys, too. And uh, that's it. I, I'm relaunching the book. It's at devmarketing.xyz? Z. Z. All right. And thanks for your time, guys. I have focused on that group so much, and you understand that customer so well. And you can see where they're still struggling, and there's an opportunity. That's when you should go into the market. But there's actually a great example of this right now. Uh, Dating Ring, have you guys heard of Dating Ring? You remember that? They were on the startup podcast. So they had this idea of what they thought people needed. They said, what people need is to not have profile photos on dating apps, because that is just a distraction. And there was all this good, heady research to back it up. People actually date better when they don't look at the profile photo first. But what did people want? <laughs> they wanted Tinder. They want to be able to see the, person, the people's face, right? And so that's the key, is you really have to understand the customer so well that you know what they actually want, right? And like I said, there's, this is like, um, the more you practice this, the more you're going to see it all the time. Uh, that people have a hard time articulating what they want, but when you actually look at what they do, right? You give them an app that has profile photos, and you give them an app that doesn't, they use this one. Even though in a focus group they might say they prefer this one, right? So that's when I would go into a competitive space. If you like, are so embedded in that group, and you're like, I understand this group, I'm passionate about this group, I see their struggle, I think I can help them have a better life, that's when you should go in. Because your competitive advantage is that you know the customer better than anyone else. Does that make sense? Uh, this is the, the old joke was, I get like hundreds and hundreds of emails from software developers. And for a while there, it was like everybody wanted to build uh, software for realtors. And I was like, do you like realtors? <laughs> and they said, no. I'm like, do you want to go to like trade shows and hang out with realtors? And they said, no. I said, do you want to get like hundreds of emails from realtors every week for the rest of your life? And they said, no. So they weren't excited about the customer. But if they were excited about the customer, then go and serve realtors and build something for them, right? At least that's been what I've seen succeed. And I think you could. I think there's space in dating because there's still a lot of struggle. I can't imagine dating right now, right? Like, there's a lot of struggle there still. And maybe there's a lot of struggle with a specific group of people that you could serve. That would be interesting, too. Yeah? Uh, how do you feel about marketing and building a user base? Serving, like a dating app, two different users to bring people together, like a job board or something? Mm. Or do you want to overload one end of it? Yeah. It depends if it's a, is it a, is it a marketplace. Or is it, because dating is a little bit different because you're bringing two lonely people together, so they're kind of like the same market. I'm thinking I want to bring together overworked freelancers with the need to get in someone who will help me. Oh, I see. Oh, yeah. interesting. So, you. Um, yeah, so if. That's interesting. Yeah, you would have to go out and find the struggles of both groups. So, you're trying to give the overworked freelancer progress in their life. 
and you're trying to give the brand new developer progress in their life. They need work, right? Yeah, you'd have to, um, the nice thing about developers is they kind of all hang out in the same spot, right? It's Hacker News, Stack Overflow, Reddit, you know, Reddit, subreddits, forums. So you can kind of find both of those groups in the same place. And that's probably where I would start. I would definitely have different landing pages for both. And if you're testing the idea, you want to see if both get equal traction. The other th reason I like landing pages is that it forces you to think about distribution right away. So before you go and build this whole product and then are like, shit, I have no way of getting to the customer, the landing page forces you to say, how am I going to get traffic to this website? right? And you might find it's way easier to get traffic to the junior developer page than it is the tired developer page. right? You might find it needs a different approach. Like, uh, how many of you here are overworked developers? Like, you have too much work. OK, so all those hands, put them back up. Read all their faces right now. You go talk to them. That might be the way you get those customers, right? Is you just hustle at events, and you shake a lot of hands, and you write down their names, and you say, hey, I'm going to reach out to you after this. If you, need, if you have work, then you contact me, and I'll hook you up with these thousands of junior developers that have signed up for my mailing list. That's what uh, Crew did uh, out of Montreal. They built relationships with all of these uh, like kind of high quality designers, devs, and then they went out and got the work, but they hustled for that. This was like more of a list sign up, and then the work was kind of over here. So you might need different ap approaches, but that's why the landing page is so great, is it forces you to think, how am I going to do it? But that was pretty good. There was like quite a few hands there. If there's competition, by the way, that's not always a bad thing. And uh, I would go and see what it was overbooked. I would go see what they're doing. Like, go and look what kind of landing pages do they have on their site, what search terms get different things, open it up in incognito, see if they're split testing something. That would be interesting. Do they cookie you on the first visit because you say you're one thing, right? That would be interesting. Uh, by the way, you got to talk to Brennan Dunn. I don't know if he's here. But, uh, Talk to, talk to Brennan about uh, serving two audiences with one page. A any other questions before I go? Yeah? How do you gracefully back out of an idea? So, like, let's say you get a couple hundred bytes on the landing Yeah. I just email them and say, hey, it, there wasn't enough interest to do this, um, and so I'm not going to do it. <laughs> I mean, think about, like, there's, I don't know. So, there's a lot of paid products that do this, right? They're like, sorry, it didn't work out. And sometimes people are pissed off. But, <laughs> trust me, you can't screw up more than I have. Like, I've built so many things, like, uh, and I'm still doing OK. So you guys are way more careful about that stuff than I am. I, I think it's better to launch and try something and go, oh, you know, it didn't work. Or sometimes you can pivot to something else. I, I think I was saying, like, there's kind of three stories, right? There's, like, the Taylor Otwell story where he's having the trouble himself, and it just happens that a lot of other people did, too, right? Then there's um, the, uh, the stories of people who started with one thing, and it didn't work, but then they pivoted to another thing, and they just kept pivoting. And sometimes that same audience just sticks with you. It's like, OK, yeah, OK, you, know, you keep going. Um, and so that, that approach can work too. And I, but I think the third approach is to, if you've done a lot of your research, you can almost start to anticipate when there's going to be a lot of traction. Like when, with marketing for developers, I knew it was going to go crazy. I just had that feeling. I was writing blog posts about it, and it was like, those were my highest traffic blog posts. Um, I think I got 3,000 signups. Like, the day I opened it up. So when, you can kind of start to feel when you've maybe got a little um, magic going on. But yeah, you can just back out. 